Hello, and thank you for joining us for the panel Operation Transformation in Technology for Multibanked Corporates. I'm your moderator, Denise Bedell, uh, Executive Director of Content to Novo. Before we begin, we have a couple of housekeeping notes. As a reminder, to participate in live polls and ask questions, you can log into the Cybos app or cybos.com or visit www.sli.do slash slidos and enter today's access code 2017 day four Cybos and select conference room one. We will be providing poll results during the session and we'll leave time at the end for Q&A. And finally, I ask you to please bear with me. I managed to get a bit of a cold before Cybos, uh, so I do apologize for the sniffles. <laughs> I'm joined today by a fabulous panel of practitioners. We have Etienne Bernard, Global Head of Transaction Banking for Crédit Agricole CIB. Kristen Michaud, Managing Director, Treasury Operations for General Electric. Kevin Pleiter, Vice President and Partner, Global COC Leader in Financial Markets at IBM Global Business Services. And Eric Schwab, Managing Director, Global Transaction Banking at TD Securities. Against a backdrop of rapid technological transformation, new models of collaboration are emerging for bank-to-corporate relations and product evolution. Concepts such as co-design and co-creation -cre are becoming buzzwords. But there can be a disconnect between what corporates want and expect from their transaction banking partners and what those banks are able to provide in an economically viable way. So to begin the discussion today, I'd like to talk about the business case for banks to be in the cash business and how we can design banks to address those economics. Etienne, we'll begin with you. Should banks be in the cash business at all? So as head of uh, transaction banking, should I say yes or should I say no? <laughs> um, so of course, um, of course, there is a business case. There are a couple of things uh, you need to, we need to know. First, in terms of volumes of transactions, the volumes of transactions are increasing on a daily basis. Actually, we expect 4 to 6% over the next years. Um, the pricing is actually slightly going down, effectively, but the technology is also, in terms of pricing, going slightly down. Um, so there is, there is a business case. The business case is around, do you have to support the other businesses within the bank? For example, a bank like mine, this is about the trade business. There is a huge trade business. We need to support the trade, business, the trade flow. Um, cash management is part of the answer. The movement from trade to cash is another, is another way to support the businesses. Um, but, but there is also a, a key business case in itself. Um, there are different ways to address cash management tomorrow as there is today. Um, and I, I guess part of the answer is we might go for a consolidation of that market. The same we see on the tech side, and we are going to discuss about that. We can see on the banking side. So yes, there is the business case, but the key point for, for us will be, of course, the cost per trade. And to maintain a cost per trade that is actually uh, interesting for the banking industry. OK, great. And Eric, let's get your perspective. Yeah, absolutely. There is, uh, there's a business case. I mean, a business case is still, you know, it's still can we make, uh, have higher revenues than, than, our, than our cost base. And I think where we as, as banks are, are finding it challenging is we're, we're still very, very good at processing transactions. Uh, we have a lot of scale. Where we're, where we're challenged now is, is that pace of change that's going on. We are saddled and, and with, with aging infrastructure that, that doesn't lend itself to, to easily changing. So that, that becomes a challenge for us. But we still have massive scale. And what we have, and now we can't rest on that, uh, but we, what we also have as, uh, as banks and financial institutions is we still have a lot of trust. Uh, people look to us and they trust in the organizations that they bank with and the banking industry as a whole. Regardless of the fact that there, there are uh, obviously, again, a lot of challenges with cyber fraud that is uh, going on in, in today's world, uh, and I don't see that going away at all uh, anytime in the near future. Actually, I don't ever see that going away. I think that it's a, it's a, a really very fast-changing environment. But we do have the size and scale uh, to combat that crime. Now, th again, the trick here is not to not to rely on that size and scale. That that is something that that you know that that kind of ego, uh, when you when you just look at your size and scale and say that's what's going to keep you going forward. It's not. We we need to evolve. 
Right, and I definitely want to get back to that. Um, but at this moment, I'd like to launch our first poll question. Uh, so our first poll question is going to be, should transaction banks act as IT companies for their corporate clients? So we're going to open the poll now. You'll have about 60 seconds to respond. So please uh, log into the app and, and let's get some responses. And now, um, just to move on, um, oh, I guess we're going to <laughs> wait a moment while we, we get our responses. OK, great. So now, how are external factors such as technology and regulation driving this transformation? Kevin, perhaps you'd like to start. Well, I think, you know, Regulation is this inevitable march that continues, and it's clearly unavoidable. Um, I think one of the challenges banks have is that there's a very reactionary approach to the regulation. Um, it's a point of, we have to do it, and I think often banks are not stepping back, and you know, we just heard here a second ago about the scale that the banks have, and, but yet they're saddled with legacy technology. Um, I think there's an opportunity with some of the spending that has to be done for regulation, um, that perhaps you spend more than what you should on satisfying the regulation, but it's invested in taking advantage of a lot of the technologies we have today. So if we start thinking around um, you know, digitally native companies, um, one would certainly not suggest that you rebuild the whole bank. Um, but there are opportunities to think about that payment workflow, for example, and think about opportunities to plug in some of this technology, bring in more of an API infrastructure, bring in things like blockchain and think about how you run your bank differently and take advantage of the fact that, particularly for regulation, you're just really providing data in a different form. And really, this is all about data. Um, at the end of the day, banks are in the data business. Uh, it's the lifeblood of what they are. So thinking around how regulation and in, in that spend, if you want, um, can be used as an opportunity to upgrade the infrastructure, I think is a big opportunity. Right. And, and with uh, uh, regulatory changes such as open banking, that's really pushing that as Correct. well. Correct. Right. Okay. Uh, Kristen, what's your perspective? Yeah, very similar. I mean, corporates, we're in a position where we're dealing with the internal complexity. So I can think about GE, we have 200 ERPs within our environment that you know, in a payments environment, we're trying to manage the inflows and outflows. And then on the reverse side, we're trying to engage with 200 different banking partners. And so to Eric's point, it's really, and Kevin, it's really about that data flow across that infrastructure and how do we take advantage of, you know, we could put a lot of hard work into connecting that data thread within our infrastructure, but when we get out to the bank and that becomes a manual process, that puts us in a bad position. So how do we kind of see the wing to wing of that yeah. um, is what we want to benefit from. Right, right. And Eric? You know, I, I, I look at this, it's funny, when, when uh, uh, for, for companies like ourselves and, and you look at, at the pace of change that's going on right now. And I look at it and I say, what, you know, what else, what else can we do? And so, you know, one of the problems, and we have a couple of corporates right here, and what we talk about a lot internally is not going to our, our corporate clients and, and saying, what do you want? When you say, what do you want, you get an answer, uh, which, you know, often we like when we're sitting in the bank and we like a quick answer that we can re we react on. Uh, but really, you're talking about what is it that you're trying to achieve? What problem are you trying to solve? And I think when you get into it from that perspective, uh, then you, you come to a better answer rather than saying something like, uh, you know, are you, they, what are you trying to reconcile? You know, you're not trying to reconcile your accounts. You're trying to, uh, you know, maybe you're trying to prevent fraud. You're trying to uh, optimize your, your cash flow. There's, there's always something different that you're, you're trying to achieve. Right. Okay. Maybe uh, on, on what you are saying, absolutely, um, there is a range of, of changes we're going through, but also we don't answer to the request, we don't do transactions, we answer to behavior. And there are new behavior, new way to manage. Um, so we're, we're not 30, maybe, but uh, here on the panel, but uh, the, the treasurers, uh, the whole people we're discussing with are also changing. They are expecting different things, faster, uh, quicker. On top of the data, we also manage the risk. Uh, we manage the security. Um, so there is a lot that we have to deliver. And effectively, today, the investments we are making enable us to be faster, more agile. Uh, so it's a good time to do that. Since 
if we look at today, but if also we look at tomorrow, we anticipate that it's going actually faster and faster every day. Uh, so there is no way that with the old technology that uh, many of the banks are relaying to uh, uh, with right now uh, can be more agile to, uh, mm. tomorrow. To yeah. tomorrow. Okay. And perhaps just one thing to add to that is you've got to remember that those treasurers and those, those corporates sitting there, they're having experiences with Uber and with other technologies mm -hmm. that are now giving them an opportunity to understand the data that can be served back to them. So one of the complexities, I think, for most of the banks now is people are coming with a, a set of experiences which are outside of the banking world. And they're approaching the bank saying, well, if I can do this over here, I know you've got the data. Why can't you give that to me? Right. So there's a, their it's almost a two-speed challenge here, which you know, is, is, is tough. Billing is an interesting topic. <laughs> it's, it's really an interesting topic if you look at the, uh, what happens outside the industry and what it will mean in the future for the banking industry. Um, how you have to bundle um, while basically usually we worked in silos. Um, effectively, it, it means a lot. Uh, we're not there yet, but it, it's, it's a moving, it's definitely moving. Right, right. And uh, that really ties into our next question. Kristen, what do multi-bank corporate treasuries want and expect from their ranking partners in it's, light of this new... So it's event? a lot of what we've talked about. I mean, it's the first time in my career in treasury that we have been talking completely about data in those discussions. Um, GE has adopted an agile uh, approach, and so we, instead of measuring and getting together with our banking partners on a quarterly basis, we're now measuring in what we call sprints, so really focused sprints. So um, it's a different dynamic than uh, we're used to in the past. And you know, we really want the data. We want the richness in the data. We want to be able to solve problems together. Um, it's about the outcomes that you talked about. Um, and it's really about the speed, because we're under a lot of cost pressure, um, either to deliver cost pressure or to drive benefits within the organization. I think at GE, we have um, moved into shared service centers. So in some ways, Treasury has turned into one element of a shared service center and one on a value driver. And a lot of that value comes from the data. And so when we, you know, we can't reduce the cost and we can't drive outcomes in the data thread, um, you know, we get a lot of pressure internally as well. Right. And uh, Kevin, how should banks be supporting the evolving digital ecosystems of their clients? Well, it's, it's, it's a really, I think, intellectually well understood <laughs> position, right? But it's the reality of actually doing it. Um, you know, part of, um, as Eric was saying, that, that legacy which has massive scale is you've also got a legacy culture. And the silos that are born around that make, you know, change very difficult. So I think you have to pick your spots. You have to think agile. Now, agile in the payment space, for example, is somewhat tough. Accuracy is really important. And you know, if you suddenly drop from doing a million transactions a day to 10 because you did a fast fail in agile, it doesn't really work. So I think the opportunity is to really work on top and think about providing data to your clients and serving that up in a, in a very innovative way. Um, that will start the engagement with clients. Um, coming in and saying to your corporates that we're going to redo the whole payments infrastructure is not exactly a good marketing message either, right? So I think being really re real, realistic around the cultural change that has to happen. I mean, the, the manual workflow, if you go to your bank and say, it's great, we're all digital, and now it hits a manual workflow, you need to change. Well, what you're actually asking them to do is change their culture, change their business process. So being a partner in that process, I think, is important. Right. And maybe uh, just to add to that, I mean, one of the things we've heard, so to carry that example forward, you know, we do a cross-border payment at GE, and our ERP upstream says it was paid. That payment analyst upstream is thinking that that money's out the door, it's in my supplier's hand. But when you start to follow those hops throughout, um, you realize it either failed you know, on the SWIFT infrastructure because it, it was missing a, a reference field, it failed at a correspondent bank, and it's sitting in Never Never Land. And, and then it's a triage to call up, pick up the phone. We've had payments take four weeks to solve, right? And then you have a bank come back and say, okay, I'm gonna solve this. Now I'm gonna have you log into my online portal. It's a step in the right direction, but it really isn't connecting that data thread right. throughout the process. Yeah. Maybe I can add something to that because I pretty much like what was said here. The, the culture of change is, is really a, a big topic 
there's not only change in, the, in what we have to deliver, it's also change in the way we manage projects. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very large um, uh, new development for, for, uh, for the bank. I am experiencing it. Uh, we are managing very large projects right now, and we have to go through tough changes in project management skills to deliver those um, and, and effectively uh, build on the fact that we need to be reliable, transparent, etc. Et of course, we, we need to do that. But on top of that, we need to actually include everything we do into the environment of our customers, coming to your example. Um, and, and, and we need to do that, so that means that the new ways of working is, this is not about front office, back office, middle office anymore, IT. This is about people together, small teams, working together in a different way. And then we come back to what you said on the Agile methodology. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, I mean, we've been talking about this a little bit just in terms of how banks are changing their product evolution and so on. So I wonder, um, do you think that uh, concepts such as co-creation or co-design, um, making use of uh, these concepts to partner with clients throughout the product evolution life cycle, uh, is the way that banks should be, should be moving? Uh, uh, actually, before we get into that, I just want to do a straw poll of, of panelists, so Etienne? Um, the answer to that question? Yes, um, yes or no? Uh, well, I, I'll be German. <laughs> Jein? Jein? <laughs> so, uh, a, a strong yes and a, and a bit no, but I will tell you why. Okay. <laughs> I say yes. Yes? <laughs> Yes, I think it's, but the answer, yes, is really around the ecosystems that you need to build around this. It's not, right. co-creation without an ecosystem is, I think, somewhat a no. Oh. <laughs> it's a strong no, probably, actually. Yeah, so we're aligned here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a yes. Yes, okay. Okay, and we actually have a poll question on this as well, so I'd like to, to get that up as well so the audience can vote on this. And you all noted that I can't, I can't lose. <laughs> 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 okay, so the poll question is, should transaction banks collaborate with corporate clients on product evolution using co-creation or co-design principles to involve clients throughout the product development cycle? So if you'd like to respond now. Okay, great. Looks like the audience take... That's a yes. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> from that's the a big yes and a small no. <laughs> yeah. So similar to your, your response. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, Kristen, maybe you can take this first. Sure. I mean, what I've found works well, and it's not necessarily in the banking environment, it could be anywhere, is really understanding the problem you're trying to solve. A lot of times, especially at, at corporates, we tend to try to solve with the technology solution first and then back into making it work for us. So when I think about co-creation, I think about identifying that joint problem statement and then solving it together. Um, I think it was interesting. I sat in a group of corporates the other morning and when we were trying to prioritize what's the most important thing to us. We all had about <laughs> 10 different answers. So I could imagine that being really difficult for the banks too to decipher what's most important as well as they balance that view out. Sure, yeah. And I definitely want to get into that with the banks. But first, Kevin, uh, what's your perspective? Well, I think this is the point, um, <laughs> which is why I had a qualified yes, um, which Etienne is, I think, with me on. I think part of the issue is if you just look at this very narrow point, um, you've got to step back and you think about what corporates are doing. So the banks are participating in a part of the flow of the entire institution. But if you take GE or any other company, you're shipping goods, you're, you're doing things. And if we think about ecosystems and we think about technologies like blockchain, for example, I mean, what you end up with is um, goods being shipped, bill of lading and, and things like that. There are triggers in that process that trigger a banking relationship. But if you can start to think about ecosystems where these things combine, then we start thinking about the fact that the goods were or were not delivered. There's a dispute resolution problem there, which gets related back to the payment. I paid you money, we need to get it back. Whether the payment was made at all. <laughs> now, if you can think about that perspective and then think about ecosystems, then you do want to co-create. Because now, I mean, IBM's been working with Maersk, for example, on you know, blockchain for shipping. Well, if we think about that and expanding that into the payment space, now while well, a bit of lading happens, I can connect into what's already there. Now I've got a, a solution for a corporate which actually marries with their business. 
So I think that's really important. But going one-on-one -on -one to clients and saying, let's co-create something cool, <laughs> you end up with 10 different yeah. things and actually nobody's happy. So I think you've got to think bigger. The reality is when you do think bigger, you will deliver somewhat smaller, of course. It's always natural. But if you're not thinking big enough, I don't think you're going to get there. And do you think corporates and, and banks are at the point where they're willing to think bigger? I think, as I said earlier, if you look at what's happening outside of our world, um, just look at an example like Uber and, and Google. Uber's built on using Google's Map API. Now, people don't realize that, but it's that kind of relationship where the data that um, Google can get from looking at all the Uber rides is valuable to them, and the map and everything else is valuable to Uber. So if you think like that, it starts to precipitate a very different perspective. Right, okay. Okay, now I, I definitely want to get the bank perspective on that, but there are some obvious challenges from a bank perspective, not least the economics. So uh, as a bank, how do you find the balance between creating solutions that your clients are looking for and making those economically viable? Etienne? Um, well, the, you change the bank, uh, the banking model, and, and the way you do it is basically you need to be very customized at the, front, at the front end together with the customers, while you need to be very standardized within the banking uh, system. What it does mean is that, from a bank perspective, you need to work out the acquisition model to be very flexible and agile. And, I, and this is what I was talking about when I referred to behavior. Uh, uh, when you are in um, the retail industry, you, you mentioned the shipping industry, um, the energy sector, there are KPIs, ways, habits that you have and that make you react differently. Those you need to capture. You need to work out. Uh, we need to work out the, with these customers. And based on that, we adapt our service. But everything that comes with processing needs to be absolutely standardized. Um, because um, um, you said, the, the, it was said just before, this is about trust and reliable. reliable. And, and there, reference, etc. There is no uh, customization possible, except that you need to give it in certain orders based on certain customers. That means that many, many institutions uh, need to actually invest heavily um, in the capacity to adapt themselves to the outside world. Um, you can also, just uh, one last word, is you need to give also options. Um, there are different ways to do cross-border payments. I mean, uh, you just go out, look at all what is uh, available on, on, uh, in the corridor, there are different ways. One way might fit our customers that are FI. One way might, might fit our corporate customers or insurers. So we need to adapt and give options. Um, and actually, at the end of the day, maybe, and we haven't solved that yet, at least for, for my part, is but you can't give actually back all the complexity because if you give 10 or, uh, 10 or 15 options, then it's, it's becoming even more complex than before. That is something that we probably need to solve, but this is about this acquisition and uh, this option, I think. So how is this a change from what existed previously? Well, for, for, for me, for, for our bank, for example, I can tell you what the, the type of projects we're doing is uh, we need to uh, adapt the engines, uh, the payment engines, adapt the technology, we need actually to be more agile, i.e. Um, uh, take away everything that is about connectivity. And now we, we, know we have applications that talk. Uh, I'm not an <laughs> IT one. Huh? I know that they talk and, they, and, and some are listening, so, so you don't <laughs> connect anymore. Uh, you put effectively um, on top of that uh, 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 all these, these data lake, this uh, uh, integration layer. And then on top of that, you put effectively what people talk about when they talk about uh, orchestration, etc., which is how you are going to use this service. Now, you need to do that in, in a very uh, nice way, because whatever you start delivering today, it's going to change tomorrow, because our customers' expectations are going to change in the next few years. Again, I'm talking, coming back to, it's going faster. And therefore, whatever we're building needs to be agile. Uh, so it is a massive change for, um, uh, for a, a, an FI or a bank like us. Uh, and this is what it means to stay in cash management. Okay. Now, Eric, what's your perspective? Yeah, I, I fully agree with what uh, Etienne has said. I mean, we, we're not going to survive if we build a, a separate solution for every single client. 
Uh, the hard part, and we've got a lot of relationship, lots and lots of relationship people in the uh, in the audience and and at Cybos right now, is every single relationship wants something different, um, or so they say. And so part of the, part of the key to that is how you are going to deliver it to them, uh, what you can layer on top. It's not it is not all a technology play. Uh, some of it is in terms of uh, your, your ability to listen to that client, understand that client the way you interact with that client. The back-end delivery model is still going to have to be a standardized model in order for us to be able to continue uh, to invest in it. If we, if we keep building singular models, we, just, we won't have that, that scale again. So I think that becomes a, a really important factor. Okay. And just uh, kind of in relation to that for, for our, our banking panelists, what do you see as the unique challenges for banking partners of multi-bank corporates and how is that affecting this whole this whole discussion? Um, multi-bank, you mean, well, that's, that's natural. I think this is a, uh, not, uh, one bank can, cannot do it all, mm -hmm. everywhere. I mean, it's, it's a very complex, very difficult, etc. You need to know what you do best, but you need to integrate as maximum as you can what the others can do as well. Mm -hmm. And it's how you actually package that back to uh, our customers. And there are, again, new way to partner. Um, it used to be uh, Swift connections in the past, MT101, we all know that, huh? <laughs> 942s, 940s, etc. Now it changed completely. Oh. And it's how you, you, you actually um, uh, connect to your, to your uh, banking partners. And by the way, you can be a lot richer today, a bit, a bit tomorrow, if I may say, because it's <laughs> happening as we speak, compared to yesterday, because yesterday it was payment only. Now. If I am uh, not good in Middle East and I want to have a consumer, how can I give that to uh, my, my, my corporate customer? Maybe I can connect with the bank that includes a retail aspect back into a package that is actually consolidated. That's, um, this is happening as we speak, and thanks to the API, I think this is really something that is, uh, that is helping us. So you can act as a consolidator on the API um, uh, as a bank, um, and put that together for um, your, your corporate and or your FI customers. Because don't forget, we also have other banks are as, as, uh, as, uh, as customers. One thing that you said that I think is really important that we've asked our banking partners to do is just to be transparent where they're really good in the market and where they're not. And you'd think that was a basic concept, but many two times we agree and we go down a path only to figure out that there's holes in that strategy and so i think that's really important i think that transparency up front is huge and i think the other piece too that has taken some time to get comfortable with is you're in a payment space so you have to be careful but like a beta version of something is a really good thing for a corporate to see and feel i think the banks are used to perfection and really wanting to give us that perfectly shiny <laughs> end product and i think in this new quick agile world you got to be a little more comfortable with something that's not perfect right? actually um it's, it's a good point because i say that to to the team all the time it should allow us to make mistakes yes um and and, and that's again that's thanks to the technology today it, it took years to do things i um, mean it still take your take a lot of time to put engines etc i mean the heavy stuff is, is taking time but but seriously, we need to be able to, um, to reinvent the model now and then and to make sometimes mistakes and stop it. This is what effectively is, um, is available now. Right. And Christian, are you finding that your banking partners are recognizing that? Yes. So I think that's kind of the underpinning of the co-development concept. If you're going to go down that path, the transparency up front with your banking partner and the trust that you know, there are going to be issues. You have to have a risk-based approach. So maybe you don't do all of your transaction volume for the pilot, right? You do a small sliver mm -hmm. to make sure that you don't break something. Um, even when we think about kind of the newer APIs and the bank reporting, you can run some of these things in parallel, make sure something kind of works and work through that with your bank and then flip over. So I think it's a different way of approaching it. Right. So you would say that this is kind of revolutionary? I would say so. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, it's even outside of the payment space and in other areas, we're pushing that within our own company as well. And, 
you know, it, it's about the culture sits underneath that of the team feeling comfortable in failure and finding issues early in the process, which is what that speed tends to drive. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, the, the question of economics actually brings us to our, our next question, which is really on, uh, brings us back to our first poll question as well. So if we could get the, the results of that up, that would be great. Uh, which is, should banks become IT companies for their working capital clients? So first of all, I want to do a straw poll of our, uh, of our panelists here. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so the answer is no. Okay. No. <laughs> no. No. All right. Wow. Very definitive. <laughs> and I believe our poll results, uh, our audience agrees with you. <laughs> Okay, um, so if no, which uh, obviously everyone, <laughs> that's everyone's perspective, uh, why not? And is this what we're seeing? Is this what some people are expecting? And, and, and why, why is this not the direction that we should take? That's you want it? me to answer? Sure. Okay. Uh, no, definitely why? Because basically um, there is a lot of value. There are very good IT companies outside, a lot of fintechs and IT companies that are providing uh, top-notch services. And, and what I want is actually be agile, be flexible. Um, if I have to create a product in-house, uh, I have to bring a lot of actually knowledge into the IT teams in-house. Um, that means that I have to take away all the energy from the front office, from the product, into the IT teams. So that's not good exactly for, for, from a P&L point of view. Then, once I've done that, they deliver, and then what do I do? Um, so it's not long term, I don't think it works. And, and effectively, you take the best of the best in terms of technology, you put your puzzle together um, based on the strategy that the banks, uh, that your bank is having. And each bank has a different strategy. Not all banks are global players, regional players, etc. And then based on that, uh, you actually focus on what you do, which is actually deliver a service. Um, we, are, we are giving loans, we are doing trades, we are doing FX. Uh, we bundle all that together to answer a customer needs based on whatever that needs can be. And this is what we are good at. Okay? And what we need also to be good at is service. And that's definitely a, um, a, something that, can, uh, that the banks in general can do better. Enhancing the service, adapting their service to, the, to, uh, to our customers. And this, this is basically, I think, um, what our role is. Okay. And Eric, maybe you can take it next. Yeah, I mean, I'd answer, I, I don't think we should be an IT company either. Uh, first off, I don't think it is, it is within our DNA. I don't think we have the uh, diversity today within our, within our banks. I think, so when I say we shouldn't become an IT company, that doesn't mean we shouldn't evolve. We, we definitely need to evolve. Uh, and that starts with a mindset. It starts with the way we think. Um, so how do you do that? You, you bring in different people into the organization. I think if today, if we were to try and transform ourselves into an IT company, we would probably pr create one really, really good product. It'd probably be, uh, it'd take five years to create, and uh, we'd have one single product that wouldn't serve the client needs by the time we deliver that, quite honestly, as a bank. So what we need to do is to bring in people, change our direction, use uh, the co-creation model. I think that's what's going to get us to where we want. Um, it's, it's an evolution. I think, you know, what's really fascinating, what's happened, I mean, the last uh, couple of sidebars, the conversation has been about fintechs, and I'm sure there's fintechs in the room, which has been a fantastic thing for the banking industry. I think it has forced us to look at ourselves differently and to start asking ourselves uh, important questions and not relying, as I started on, on our size and, and, and sitting back and saying, we, we're banks, we're strong, we're going to be there forever. Uh, we, we can be there for a long time, but we need to adapt along the way. Yeah. Okay. And Kevin? Well, I think... Um it's important to note that I think many banks were in some ways IT companies in the past, and they, they had to be. Um, I think to truly differentiate themselves um, and you, with the technology that was available at the time, it was somewhat inevitable. I think it's important to note now when you look at the current technologies that are available and we think about building up from the bottom, so thinking around cloud technologies and the APIs that are available, thinking about how you deliver with Agile, what you deliver with microservices and things like that. It gets to the, uh, the listening and the, the talking 
um, it, it changes the way that you can operate. And I think there's two challenges the banks have. One is speed, and the other one is talent. And I think with speed, a, a good example is if you go to the regular IT, legacy IT department, and you say, I need 10 servers in order to do this, they'll say, well, in three months' time, come back, and I'll give you 10 servers. <laughs> now I can go to a, a IBM cloud, a Microsoft cloud, or whatever the cloud is, and I can procure a server in seconds. Um, there's a big speed element. Um, when you think about APIs and you think about the technology that's available, I can plug into things and have capabilities available very, very quickly. I don't need to write a million lines of code to get there. There's open source, there's other things that give me the speed. And the challenge then you have internally is the talent is very good at managing and looking after the legacy technology. Mm -hmm. um, so the banks really have to think around how they can bring in talent because I can tell you a lot of graduates coming out of school right now are not that excited to go and work for the local bank because it's not seen as innovative. But if they start to see the fact that um, the banks are putting everything on the cloud, within reason of course, that they're being um, agile in the way they do things, that they're using a lot of this modern technology, it attracts the talent. And that then provides obviously the, the scale effect that you need mm. in order to move forward. Okay, and Kristen. Yeah, very similar. I think, um, you know, I think if they're pure technology, I, I don't know that that's going to be the benefit. I think there's a lot of products out there. And, you know, I again, go back to the internal complexity of a corporate about having to deal with all of our own internal IT issues and then facing off to 200 technology banks would be another nightmare for me. So um, I really look at them to be solving business problems, leveraging the best technology in the marketplace. And I think the talent's a big one. Um, we, we've seen that too in, at, at GE that, you know, the skill set that we're looking to hire, you know, I think about a, a, we don't hire the button pusher, the manual payment processor anymore. We're trying to hire that new skill set that's trying to get rid of those manual payments and think about them differently. And I think the same holds true at the banks. Right. Okay. Yeah, I may, I may even add something. Um, for example, when you, when you rebuild uh, uh, the engine or whatever, I have, I have a KPI to say you keep it standard. You don't change anything, please. If you do, uh, that's really a problem. So, so there is things you really take, take and, and after the bundle, the customization that comes on top, this is where the add value is in terms of service, yes. Okay, that's great. Um, now, um, I just have a couple of more questions. Um, uh, in light of the, all of this technological change and everything that's happening, um, is there a future for banks? Should banks exist, given the, how this technological transformation is happening? That's a question you have. <laughs> is there a future for banks? The answer is absolutely yes. Huh. Um, and and the, um, if the bank really take the bets of changing the, their model and changing and adapting themselves, and now anticipating what's coming to, to the banking industry. So effectively, there is, it's actually um, very interesting. The time we're, we're in right now are absolutely interesting. Um, we, we are in a changing environment, we're pushed by the ring tech, the fintech, um, uh, our customers, the environment, there is a challenges everywhere from the, from the regulators coming with new needs, new requirements. It's coming at, 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 uh, at, at a speed from, from everywhere, but it gives us a chance uh, to, to come with different model, different answers. Uh, so, so it's very rich. Uh, for us, there is, of course, we have two different pace. One on the retail space, uh, which is uh, actually fascinating. It's, go it's going even faster than on the corporate uh, space uh, in terms of, of changes. And that, that is a real opportunity. And I think many banks understood that, and, and, the, um, and the FI environment is absolutely adapting itself. Okay. And Eric? Yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a place for banks. I think what's Really interesting that's happened is, uh, and we were talking about this yesterday a little bit, traditionally cor in, in the banking space, corporates could do things that individuals couldn't do because they were, they were big and they had uh, interesting technology. Now, individuals can do things that, that corporates can't do, which I think is what you're alluding to, Etienne. Yeah. You, know, you can go onto your phone and you can quickly, you, know, you can buy music, you can buy a package, you can buy, you can buy anything. Uh, that, that's the challenge on the corporate end. So 
you know, what, is, what does that mean that's going to happen uh, or what has been happening? I think regulators are out there and they're, they're telling everyone that we need more choices uh, because you have it on the personal end. So every, everyone should have more choices. So they're, they're opening things up. They're opening banking up. So as we open and we go to a, a world of, of open banking, you run into this other problem, which is you, you become, you have issues with privacy potentially. You have issues with what happens when a, when a fintech or somebody else fails. And actually, I shouldn't point out a fintech. Anyone along the chain fails. Uh, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. And today, obviously, the banks are regulated, so they maintain a certain amount of capital, and so there is some safety and comfort uh, in that. In the future, and things, again, we talked about cyber, cyber fraud early on. Uh, so what happens? Again, traditionally, we've wanted things to go faster and faster and faster, and that's the retail experience. We want very, very fast. In the corporate space, when something goes wrong, uh, especially when there's a fraudulent payment, at times we want things to stop. We want them to stop dead in their tracks. We don't want them to go through and have already made five hops around the world so that we can never, we can never track it. So, you know, the question was, do I think there's a place for banks? Absolutely, I think there's a place for banks. I think in this, in this value chain, which is long, and I think there's lots of places for people to play, uh, again, with the fintechs, uh, both small and large, uh, banks, small and large, uh, the, the, you know, we still have networks of banks because that's, you know, what we need to move uh, payments around or w one of the ways to move payments around. So, yeah, I think there's, I think it will last uh, a long time. But as, as we've talked about, it's been a theme here. Uh, there, there is an evolution that is happening and we can't, we can't be those same banks that we were even three years ago. Right. And just to, to, uh tie into that, what does the future transaction bank look like? And uh, what does the transaction banking market look like in the future? Uh, the transaction bank, I mean, transaction banking is still going to stay uh, close to clients. It's always going to be close to clients. And I think, so I came from the corporate space, uh, uh, from the corporate cash management space, dealing with corporates, and moved over into the, the sort of correspondent banking space a number of years ago. And I think sometimes when I hear a lot about the, the correspondent banking space, there's a lot, and we're talking about our bank's payments, my payments, your payments, going back and forth. And I think sometimes, at least in the conversations I have, we, we get lost in the fact that there's underlying transactions. It's an individual, it's a company, it's something else. It's not just a bank to bank. The, the, it involves a real transfer of goods, a real transfer of value. Um, so, so, you know, what does a transaction bank look like? It looks, it looks like something, it looks similar to what we have today, I guess, um, just with a different slant, which is taking, getting away from that transaction for transaction and saying, how can I deliver value to, to my clients for that, for that end client, that people are looking at a full value chain? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and Kevin, what's your perspective? Well, as I said earlier, I think we need to look at those bigger ecosystems, which I think Eric's really alluding to, right? I mean, at the end of the day, there's somebody that's you know, buying computers in China or delivering iron ore. They're, do, they're doing something. Um, the bank is, is, in some ways, a necessary evil, right? Um, <laughs> I don't mean that badly. <laughs> um, but, you know, when, when something gets stuck in a port because a payment's not made, the, the payment is, is the problem, but the real problem is if they're, if they're um, goods, avocados or something, and they're rotting in the port, there's a loss of income as well as the payment failing. So I think you have to look at those broader ecosystems and look at how banks can add value to the ecosystem. And I think when you look like that, um, banking looks very different. Um, it doesn't become a, a very impersonal payment um, manufacturer, if you want. It becomes part of and getting those avocados or iron ore or whatever uh, through the process. And I think banks can, um, in almost some ways, become more personal because they say, hey, you know what? I'm helping deliver avocados today. I didn't just make a bank payment in you know, Nigeria because that's where the avocados came from. I mean, it's, it's an evolution, I think, that's inevitable. And again, when you look outside and you look at the Ubers of this world, they didn't, you know, Airbnb, 
they didn't do anything other than make it a very personal experience that you connect with, and that's where people are looking. And I think it's a great opportunity for banks. Um, on top of that, with cybersecurity, because banks essentially become holders of identity, and that is a very precious point that banks will always have. They're very trusted today. I think an opportunity is to maintain that, and I think they become then a crucial part of the ecosystem because they're the holders of identity. I think there's an opportunity there. Okay, and Kristen? Yeah, no, very similar. I think the process thread is really important, and the thing I would add to that um, is also that intelligent analytics for us. Um, one of the things we're pushing our banking partners for is, you know, you see all of our payments, you see all of our receivables. You know, are we paying our suppliers faster than we're collecting from our customers? And, you know, help us look at the analytics underneath that. Help us look at the regional jurisdiction, the currencies, and do more of that value-added service on the data side. So I think that's another area where they'll have to evolve into. Right. Yeah. And, and just to take us out, Etienne, how is this transforming the, the banking landscape? What does the, banking, the transaction banking landscape, landscape look like in five years or ten years? Well, I think we're... I'm just pretty much in line with uh, what Kevin was, was uh, mentioning just before is uh, we're, not, we're not going to sell transactions per se. Um, we're going to be part of a service. We're going to be bundled in a service. Um, take an energy company opening, I don't know, a contract for an individual somewhere. Um, part of that contract is the first payment to open the electricity. Um, you sign instant payment gone, you get the electricity. You don't see the transaction, but it's transaction banking. Oh. So, so I think this is what we're going to do tomorrow, is we're going to enter into a more service, um, and what I was referring to behavior, service space, uh, where transaction is part of the service, is bundled into the service. Fraud prevention. You change behavior. Uh, why? Uh, Without being too intrusive, uh, that's always the point, yes? but, but basically we need to adapt ourselves to add services to help uh, uh, enhance security. Uh, and as you know, there is a lot of discussions right now around that, is how we, we, we can do that. So these are all the service around the transactions uh, that is part of the day-to-day -day life of a corporate customer when they sell or when they buy, and how you can help that, uh, that process. Uh, one more is about the management of risk. I mean, we don't speak about risk, but a couple of years ago, I mean, it was still slightly coming out of that, we still had a liquidity crisis and all these crises. It can happen again uh, somewhere in the world uh, tomorrow, is how you face that, how you manage those, uh, uh, th those liquidity crises. But risk management on top of uh, servicing the other part of the business. Again, I'm coming back to the trade business, whether it's open account or LC-based, I don't know, depending on the risk um, a, a, a corporate uh, would like to face, is how you support that, including the payments. Uh, so these are all the processes. So for me, transaction banking is actually coming slightly away, purely from the transaction mode into the service mode, based on behaviors. Okay. That's great. Well, that's all the questions I have for the panel, so we'd like to open it up to the floor now. Uh, so if you do have any questions, please feel free to, to log them on your, through, the, through the app or on cybos.com. And we have uh, one question at the moment for Kristen. Uh, how has the GE digital transformation led by Jeff Immelt impacted the treasury function? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we've been on a digital journey. Um, we are now considered a digital industrial company, and so we talk about a lot about our digital store. So each of the businesses at GE are encouraged to deposit their digital assets into a store so that they're reusable across the company. And so um, Treasury being one of those, one of the things that we did at the beginning of the year was think about all the richness and data that we have through our payment systems and through our bank reporting. Um, and we actually put that in the GE store, which helped the CFOs in each of the businesses start to do better forecasting analytics on their data, see their payables, their receivables. And it's become a, an app, as we call it, in that digital store that enables them to lower, you know, in essence, over time, our liquidity buffer as a company, which is pure cost back to those businesses. So um, really going through that transformation, a lot of what comes out of that digital mindset is also the speed and the things that we talked about earlier as well that goes into that. Right. Okay. 
Okay, uh, Kristen, I actually have a question for you. Sure. Uh, given the, the transformation, the discussion we've had today, does GE have 200 uh, banking partners in five years? <laughs> our, <laughs> our end state target is to be down to less than 65, which is still a lot of banking partners globally. But um, given you know our business model, if, if it's not obvious, is a lot of the buying and selling of assets in the industry. It makes it very hard to really get at those underlying numbers. So. You know, we started a year ago at 15,000 bank accounts. We're down to 9,000 bank accounts, so big process there. 320 bank partners. We're down to less than 200. Um, we're on a journey, but a lot of that, too, is simplifying some of the infrastructure, which goes upstream into those ERPs and the business process side. So definitely less than a couple hundred, <laughs> hopefully less than 65. We'll see. <laughs> And would you say that this journey that the banks are on is, is also helping to drive the same journey for corporates? It's, it definitely is. So it's, you know, we haven't historically selected banking partners based on their technology capabilities, their data analytics. This is the first time that that's one of the scorecard elements that we're really looking at and measuring. Can they move quickly? Can they deliver? Are they transparent with us in the conversations? And then can we leverage their digital assets to enable our strategy? Whereas before, I think GE was more of building our own, developing our own. We're trying to leverage that great footprint that our banking partners have and really utilize that. Right. Um, so definitely aligned with what everybody said on the panel. Okay. Actually, I wonder if our other panelists could, could address that as well. Are you seeing that with your clients? Is, is, is your discussion changing as a result of the, the, the process that you're going through? Yeah, well, effectively, our, uh, the, this is actually evolving the discussions. First, of course, first we, we talk a lot about what's coming in the market. It's difficult for, to, to follow, actually, from a corporate point of view, all the trends in, in the markets. I mean, effectively, one day you wake up with blockchain, then, uh, then you end up having other technology being uh, being pushed at you, etc. So people are a bit, a bit tend to be a bit lost, uh, and ask the question, "What's in it for me?" Basically, oh. and it's less about technology and more about service. Uh, but, but it means a lot for us, also from an HR point of view. Um, we didn't mention anything about people, uh, but from a people in the banking industry, it's a huge change. Um, the way we sell. Uh, the way we discuss with our customers, I shouldn't say sell, but <laughs> the way we, we discuss with, with our customers, uh, the type of solutions, adapting a solution uh, to, to our customers needs a lot of, um, uh, we need a lot of actually uh, intensity in terms of dialogue, need a lot of knowledge around, around the uh, ecosystem, etc. So I think the, the people needs to learn a lot. So it's a changing environment also for from um, from effectively a front office point of view, from an implementation point of view, to follow projects which are um, sometimes involving not only the bank and the corporate, but also uh, other uh, other parties. So yes, uh, the, the, it's it's a journey. Um, I'm passionate about, about the journey. <laughs> by the way, there is there is so many things that we need to go through, um, but the, there is a clear there is a clear goal, um, and. Uh, that makes the, the, the bank even closer to the ecosystem of the corporates. So okay. that's great from that. I think IBM sits in a funny perspective here because we're a corporate and we're an IT company. <laughs> yeah. um, one of the things we've done with some of these new technologies with blockchain, for example, in our global financing group, we've implemented blockchain. Yeah. Um, what that's done is dramatically reduce um, dispute resolutions, dramatically. And of those that have to have some manual intervention, we can solve them very, very quickly. And now we're talking about you know, single digit numbers of disputes that are actually going through the regular old physical process. So you know, I think for us, there's a great examples we bring back to our banking clients and to other corporates who we work with and say, you know, essentially we're eating our own dog food over here. Um, and the business case was very simple because just looking at those disputes, the time, the money, the effort, you very, very quickly can say, hey, there's real benefit here. And that's that point I was making when you look at the ecosystem, is looking at parts of it that you can bring this new technology into that doesn't upset the payment flow, that doesn't upset the other things, but gives you the value, allows you to drive analytics, allows you to drive insight, and then start building on top of that. Right. Yeah, I, I don't know what the next product is, and it's, it, it's difficult to, to figure out the product, but I think what's underlying it is the data. Uh, people want data. They want rich data. They want more of it. Uh, they want to consume it in different ways. So for us, it's about how do we how do we get them fulsome data. 
and then uh, and then what then then again what can we co-create with them? Is there is there a way to take that data and and make it you know more more can they ingest it better? Is there a way that we can give them to? Is there something we can bundle around it uh, that provides them value? So I think you know it's that kind of conversation that we're really having with our clients today. Okay. Uh, we have another audience question. Will Swift GPI and instant payments speed up the digital transformation projects at banks uh, for the advantage of their corporate clients? Well, Swift GPI is, is a very interesting way for corporates and other FIs to track um, their, their payments and, and to push also for a same-day settlement in a way. Uh, so, so yes, it's, it's very interesting. Um, does, it, does it push for more digital? I'm not sure, actually. It, it helps being more efficient in the way you track your payments. Um, um, that's it for me. I mean, yeah, I, th I think it's, uh, you know, what, so what, how do I look at it? I say that it is going to create efficiencies within the banking market. It's going to, it provides transparencies and, and efficiencies. When it does that, uh, it allows us to spend our time on other things that are more value add. And if that's where it leads to in a, in a digital transformation, perhaps that's one of the outputs. I don't know that that was an intent, but that's how we, that's how we uh, are seeing things internally. I think the, the, the purpose is anyway, and this is actually it's more, less digital, more about transparency. It's about you track what is done and you know each time where it is. Coming back to your earlier uh, statements, <laughs> uh, you can't lie about, okay, it's done. No, it, it, where is it? And, and, and this is something that is also uh, part of the service process that we need to have as a bank to help untrap <laughs> what is actually going wrong. Because this is actually effectively what we need to uh, help corporates uh, about, is about managing what is going wrong, which is not STP processed. So that it's really important to us. Um, it will be a mandatory item to be one of those target state banks. Um, I have hundreds of people on my team in shared service centers that are tracking down cross-border payments daily and running triage, and we call that wasted motion at GE, right? And um, the intent is to put those folks in more value-added opportunities in the company, not chasing down, calling up our bank partners. So I think there's an opportunity for the bank partners to lean their customer service side where we're calling them and harassing them all day for a status um, by making that more digital. And it's a more meaningful, I mean, who wants to have that job where you're just tracking down a payment all day? So put in a digital form um, and it should be a game changer. And I think the, the key will be how do we ingest that message upstream and complete that digital stream? I think that'll be a push on our ERPs and our process internally, but I think it'll be a big one for us. And it, will, it is helping the uh, banking industry because you will see rapidly where who is in and who is out. Um, and, and for us, for example, it's kind of mandatory anyway, being the banks for other banks. If you don't do it, then we st our customers, which are other banks, can't do it as well. So, <laughs> so that's actually what triggered. This was not a question. Um, and I think this is what's happening on the market. And that actually ties into another question I have is, um, are we going to see consolidation? And how much consolidation are we going to see as a result of all of this change that's happening? Oh, I'll, take <laughs> I'll take this one as a, as a first. Um, uh, well, I always thought um, that, and actually for a long time, that there will be consolidation on that market because of the level of investment you need to, uh, to follow. And, and actually what happened is a bit different is actually there was some institutions that retrench in their domestic markets um, and some that, that actually uh, strive for being more uh, 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 regional. So, um, but I think further down the line, probably yes. Now, there is a trick uh, in, in the consolidation, and uh, there I'm really, really referring to transaction banking. Mm -hmm. It's very complex. Um, to, uh, to merge two IT environments in a transaction banking space, and I've been there personally, um, is extremely complex. Um, in a world where you need to be agile, uh, to ad constantly adapt yourself to new behavior, um, you tend to, if I may say so, lose time. Uh, so potentially yes, uh, but not easy to manage. I think technology is gonna play a very big part in it for that exact reason. And when you look, again, outside of banking, 
in more of the adjacent spaces, when you think of PayPal and you think of mm. what Alibaba's doing, um, they're building highly digital, um, highly high-touch environments, which could start to bleed into this space. And I think that's going to force um, some of the consolidation. And I think with the consolidation, when you look at the m and activity and you look at can you make money out of it, mm. I think technology is going to play a very big part in realizing the uh, economies of scale and things that can come from those things. Right. So. Okay, I'm going to just uh, cut things off there. We're just uh, finishing up. So I just wanted to say thank you very much for joining us today for this uh, very topical discussion. And thank you to our wonderful panelists for their insights. And that concludes today's panel on operation transformation in technology for multi-bank corporates. Thank you.